now Stuart Hood takes us into the late, late hours on four, After Dark. Welcome to After Dark for another live discussion. But we don't have a fixed finishing time, so who knows where we might get to. Before we start, thank you for all your letters. Please keep them coming. If you'd like to appear on a future After Dark, there'll be an address you can write to at the end of the program. And of course, there's a phone number in the TV Times. Well, this evening, the guests who've come to talk about this evening's subject are Naim Atala. He was born in Palestine. He arrived in England at the end of the 40s to do an engineering degree at Battersea Polytechnic. He's now a highly successful publisher whose group includes the Women's Press. And he's the author of Women as a collection of his interviews with 289 women. Married since 1956, he has one son. Carl Macmillan was born in Zimbabwe, the eldest of eight children. She studied philosophy at London University and is married with four children. Mary Whitehouse is best known for her presidency of the National Association of Viewers and Listeners, which has been a kind of watchdog in the moral attitude of the media. She's been married since 1940, so her golden wedding is only two years away. <laughs> At the age of 22, she fell in love with a much older married man, and she may want to talk about the importance or otherwise of that experience during the course of the program. I <laughs> Joan Wyndham is a writer. Her latest books are Love Lessons and Love is Blue, and they describe what one might call her sexual and sentimental education in World War II. She was married for seven years and divorced, and is at present living with a husband who, with whom she's been married for the last 30 years. Uh, in what one just she describes as an open marriage. Yeah. Julie Grant works for the National Union of Students. She got married at 16, has a daughter of 12, and now lives with her a woman partner. James Dearden, the scriptwriter, son of the famous film director Basil Dearden, went to Eton and enjoyed the 60s, I understand. Is now monogamously married with a son and is the author of the screenplay, The Fatal Attraction, based, I believe, on an incident in his life, and he may want to talk about that later on, too. Well, the last of our guests is Cher Height, who is the author of the world famous Height Report and the Height Report on Male Sexuality, which came out in 1982. And yesterday, the third part of this trilogy, with three volumes of work, The Woman in Love has been published in this country. She's been married for two years to a woman who's considerably junior to herself. I beg your pardon, she's been married to a man <laughs> 20 years <laughs> younger than herself. Uh, now, I, I want this, uh, I'm told I must talk about myself, so I shall say that I'm a writer, I've worked in television and radio, and I've been married three times. Now, what we want to talk about tonight are is the theme of women and love, women and marriage. And we, I want to start off by talking a little bit about uh, Cher Height's book, which seems to me an extraordinary and very interesting production. This uh, whole chorus of voices, which uh, any man who l listens to them must feel very disturbed by, and which give an extraordinary picture of how women find themselves in society today and inside marriage today. But we won't just talk about marriage, we'll talk about many other things beyond that, quite obviously. The problem is that since the 60s, we've had great revolution, some people would say, in sexual mores and relationships between the sexes. But the problem is, has anything actually really changed very much? How much has changed? I think that's an important question to ask. Um, and I think I'd like to start by asking Cher Height how she explains a very interesting paradox which is that women appear to enter marriage with the aim of sharing in something in common with a man, and that very often, to judge by the evidence in my book, loneliness is the result. What do you think that comes from? Why is that? Well, you could say that men and women uh, in our society really live in two different cultures. Not that that's a biological matter, but somehow or another over time, we develop these two different roles. Women are supposed to be nurturing and supportive, whereas men are supposed to go out and conquer the world and us. 
And uh, if you have two people with two different sets of values living together, it's hard for them to communicate. And mm -hmm. that may make you lonely, especially <coughs> if you're women who would like to talk more deeply. Does that strike a bell in other women around this table? Carol, do you feel that? I don't know at all, actually. Um, I'm not sure about this contrast we presumably pose between the values of women and the values of men. Um, <coughs> what's the evidence for that? I mean, <laughs> interestingly, you say women are supposed to be nurturing and caring. Men are supposed to conquer the world. Um, let's ask the question of actually how many men actually carry out those, that kind of supposition and how many women, too, are actually successful, if you like, in being nurturing and caring. Uh, this, it seems to me there's just so much assertion there, um, and I'm not convinced that what you say is something that may necessarily be accepted. Um, just simply by virtue of being a woman, one is not necessarily nurturing and caring. And <coughs> I think also one thing I feel quite strongly about, um, given the extent to which feminism has taken on this idea of women being, <coughs> excuse me, being nurturing and caring, is that these are actually qualities one has to strive for um, as an individual, as a person. I don't think there are things, if you like, that can be foisted upon you. Um, that you can be indoctrinated into. Otherwise, it, is, it becomes something that is actually very false and inauthentic. I mean, that's certainly one thing I would want to say. And um, to that extent, I think particularly in this modern, you know, modern Western industrial society with its emphasis on materialism, its emphasis on individualism, I think the real question isn't... Um, have men conquered the world, if you like? But also, there is a very, uh, a very real question too, of how women, how far have women in this society actually got um, towards, um, how can I put it, been expressive of those kinds of roles? <laughs> I, I, I don't feel so praiseworthy about about women as a group in the way that you seem to be suggesting. I think there's individuals, and. Um, of whatever sex is a struggle, if you like, to attain these, you know, these, these positive qualities. I, I find an awful lot of, of my younger friends who are married that the man is taking over a lot of the nurturing and caring, and more and more they are helping with the children and changing the nappies and so on. Maybe the women are going out to work and so on, and they are sharing it between them which they didn't used to do. I think it, it's something that's becoming more and more common and very nice too. Was that reflected in the interviews you carried out? Yes, in certainly. I think things have changed dramatically. I think the last few years, women have gone out in the marketplace. They've done things they've never done before. There has been tremendous amount of, of challenge. And I think men have realized that, you know, there are no specific roles to play. And so, therefore, they share. I mean, I do, I do sometimes. I help in the home. And I think also marriage, the, the, the problem with marriage about loneliness is that the fact is that if you marry, I mean, you're supposed to be complementary. And the more you have different, if you like, you have the different interests, the more interesting the marriage is. So you're able to come home and tell your wife things, perhaps, and she can come home and tell you things. And I think for a marriage to last, I think it must develop in the end into a kind of apart from the initial passion, it must, it, it must end up in, in a kind of friendship. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, that, that's how marriage lasts, I think. Oh, yes, I mean, the big thing at the beginning is sexual, and then that sort of changes. That fizzes out it? a bit, and that then, then it <laughs> fizzes out. Unless you're very <laughs> lucky, <laughs> I was going to say. No, but you can't no, sustain I agree. You can't I'm sustain talking it for uh, 30 if years. If you survive the first six months, yeah. you become friends, yeah. or you split up, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. You have to develop that companionship. It's, it's, you have to be able to talk to each other totally openly and honestly. Yeah, except and you can do that among friends. If you're not friends, you, then you can't, you can't have that kind of relationship. I didn't mean that sex fizzled out after six months. <laughs> that was the, you know, more like after ten years, perhaps. It starts to be a little bit less important. But if you're in love, I mean, it, it does play a, a very vital role, sex, but it's, it's not, <laughs> th there isn't the tension that you have in the, in the early years. So the it, it just jealousies. yeah, the type of jealousies. Then then each one evolves, and your roles are different. 
Julie, what do you think about what's been said up to now? Well, it's just, I thought we just skipped a stage in a way and left the question unaddressed. And that, that was really that, um, I, I mean, I think that women are forced into roles. And I think the experience that some people were expressing was not the experience of the majority of women who are forced into a position. And certainly they work, and they've always worked, you know, and they do that successfully the way that they do a lot of things successfully. But um, I feel that we didn't really look at that question because, I mean, I, I think that I would tend to agree with what was first said by, by Sheer Height. And um, I, I don't think that there's any evidence that women, for example, are experiencing this idea of the new man. Yeah, I'd like to see us talk a bit more about that because um, that also is an assumption. It's very big in, in um, the media at the moment that there is this new man. But in my experience and the experience of women that I know and have worked alongside or with, we don't see that new man. Um, and I think that's probably a minority of women's experience. I think the majority of women um, don't have um, a relationship where the man is caring and supportive and where he provides childcare support and things mm -hmm. like that. We have to be very careful <coughs> to say if we're talking about a minority, you know, so. Um, I mean, that may be true, that? but I think that at least men are aware on a much broader level that they should at least um, be trying to help out and be supportive. Do they they may all, do they do it? well, we all fall short of our ideals. I agree with you. I'm sure that most men perhaps are still caught in the same behavioral patterns, but I think things are slowly <laughs> changing. Things are never going to change overnight. It's been, what, 10 well, years yeah. or 20 years since people have sort of started talking about newly defined relationships. I think it, 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 you couldn't expect the world to have changed in 20 years. It's probably going to take 100, 200 years, I don't know, a long time. It, it is slowly happening. I think in most cities where couples tend to both work, I think you will find that, uh, that the, the man does do a lot more than he did 20 years ago. He may still not do enough. They're still, when they both get home from work, there may be the tacit assumption that it's the wife that gets out uh, the food and puts it in the oven. I don't know. Um, but at least people are aware that perhaps they should be making more of an effort. And I think slowly people are changing their, their behavior. And I think there will be a, a, a situations in the future where the man stays at home all the time, and why not? I think just as women shouldn't feel in any sense that, that they've they failed as people if they're quite happy to stay at home, I think lots of women are quite happy to stay at home. Equally, men should feel quite happy to stay at home if they want to stay at home. I think everybody should just find the role that suits them. And it's just that we expect men to go out and be the breadwinners. Why, mm -hmm. why, why shouldn't women go out and be the breadwinners and, and men stay at home? There's nothing women shameful always about have been that. the breadwinners. Hmm? Yeah. There's nothing shameful about a man staying at home. Absolutely. I, I couldn't either. agree more. But it depends what you mean by being supportive, though. I think, I think men are very supportive in many ways. But what I found, that perhaps women are more supportive in a different sense. If your husband works, uh, b b b your wife or your, your, your girlfriend, she's more supportive of you in that sense than you would be of her. Men are not very supportive of women career-wise. I mean, when you see, say, a successful husband, uh, his wife uh, always in uh, encourages him more often than not. Whereas men seem, even in our day, some men seem to resent uh, the, the success of their wives. So, th so the wives have got to be much more careful not to be seen to be more successful than their husbands, whereas the, re the, the reverse is not true. Well, I think that's because male egos are still bound up with success and, and, and earning money, and that, that, again, is something that should probably be changed. <laughs> I've been sitting here listening to all this, yes. and, and I have to say that a lot of it really has an air of unreality to me. I mean, the idea that suddenly, over the last 10 years, uh, men are, are being forced almost into the position where they've got to help with the housework and this kind of thing. I, I think this is all terribly unreal. I mean, as, uh, <coughs> as Stuart said, we've been married now for nearly 50 years. And admittedly, I started to have our first child straight away. Now, my husband will be watching this tonight, and what I say he will know to be true. All the time we've been married, he has cooked the Sunday dinner, right? What about the uh, other six days of the week? Sorry? <laughs> what about the other well, six days of the week? I think, I, I, 
I can't relate to what you're saying either because it strikes me as terribly unreal. Um, <coughs> the, the whole question of being caring and supportive, you're taking, I think, in a, in a, um, b because of the feminist movement and because of, I think, some very kind of positive criticism which I'm very sympathetic towards and which you obviously support, um, the whole notion of caring, if you like, is being pushed into a kind of very emotional kind of role. I mean, in, in a very traditional way, in, in, in a traditional circumstances where, I suppose contraception, if you like, is the, is the thing that has totally revolutionized things. Um, where a woman expected to be, to be bearing children every two years for God knows how long. Um, the question of whether she worked or he worked was just academic, if you like. Um, if you, the contingencies of life, one's body determined the different roles. Um, similarly, um, the man's attitude, if you like, of coming home from work into a meal. You know, I just can't imagine a minor, if you like, who's been st uh, stooping all day underground, coming in and wondering whether he ought to do the dishes. I mean, you know, there's, there's work people do that is actually really physically exhausting. And when they come in, the kinds of roles that have developed in certain circumstances are very intelligible. They relate to the kinds of lives people have got and what's going on in them. And um, perhaps one of the dangers we've got is that so much of what is being said here is perhaps um, um, significant in the circumstances of a certain, perhaps social class, in well, terms of, course, of certain everything is always relative to every single person's unique position. Yeah, I I, I'm not that talking I about a yes. unique position. Mm. I'm talking about groups of people. Mm. And what we're saying here isn't uh, relative to people's unique positions. The mere fact that we have a conversation here, okay, there's a certain uniqueness here, but without any doubt we have loads in common. That's what makes conversation mm. possible. Recognizing that individuality doesn't preclude um, contact between us. But, but I what I see, you see, the what always seems to end up in these conversations is that people immediately take positions and get slightly polarized. I, th I think what you're saying is perfectly true. There are many situations where the woman enjoys looking, nurturing as you, uh, her, her man when he comes home. It's not such a question of whether you enjoy it or not. Or, or whatever, or not. he expects it, then maybe you, you're saying he's entitled to expect it if he works in an no, incredibly no, I'm hard not talking, physical I'm not, job. I'm not talking about entitlement. I'm not talking about rights. What I am trying to do is to understand how these sorts of roles develop. And what I'm suspicious about is, um, if you like, the argument given that these roles have developed, if you like, because of male chauvinism or patriarchy or whatever. I mean, that's, that is the actual issue I'm interested in. Because what, what we have, if you like, is a description of the roles, and then what is offered is an analysis of why they've developed in this kind of way. This that's is an the interesting awful long question. way away, I feel, from real people. And you see, men and women have lived together, they have married, they've had their homes, they've had their children. And through the years, men and women have loved one another. There have been situations in which, you know, the woman has allowed herself very often to be put upon, if you like. But for every one like that, and I count myself in this, I, I was teaching, uh, as I said, Soon after we were married, I started to carry our first child, and I gave up teaching. Now then, the years in which I was having my children, caring for my children, the most demanding, the most fulfilling, the most rich years of my life. And I think all this business of, you know, here's feminism, we've got to find the new man. I, I think a lot of it's an awful lot of tripe, to tell the truth. I mean, if you get down to real people and how they live and, and work with one another and care for one another, and, and there's nothing in any way demeaning or in any way a sort of secondary activity in bearing and loving and caring for children. I, I think in all the things I've done <laughs> for all my life that having children and the opportunity to have children I think that's the most yes, wonderful thing that, that, that happens in life. I would like to add something, and that is a sort of historical note. I mean, I'm sure you wouldn't, any of you, want to go back to the time before women had the vote. And certainly we have the feminist movement to thank for having the vote. The recent feminist movement has given us all a lot. And some of the media excesses, like the new man and phrases like this, 
we might all abhor. But still, the basic ideals, I, I, is there anyone here who disagrees with them? No, I think, I think, uh, I think uh, the thing That's that we must realize <laughs> is that in the past, before the feminist movement, there were great disadvantages being a woman. I mean, the disadvantages of being when a woman did the were... I mean, what do you mean, the feminist Well, movement? the feminists when brought it to light. The feminists what? brought it to light. That's what they did. I mean, even the extreme feminists brought the thing to light that there were women uh, were at a disadvantage. Certainly in jobs, women were confined to the, uh, the house. They were, they were strict. I mean, they were conditioned to the fact that a girl had to get married mm. to look after her husband. They were not but given how equal far opportunity. Back are you going? Well, we're talking about 20 years ago. Not oh, a, I mean, it, well, it isn't true of 20 years ago. It was quite hard I mean, for women yeah. more than 20 years ago to have fruitful jobs and careers and earn decent money. Come on. Well, right, but then you once again put the job, the, the career, as sort of, you know, the centre thing. No, as but what is simply the, saying that the for those women who want to make that choice, it should be available well, for them. Well, of course, but it was, I mean, anybody thinks it wasn't available before. Well, it wasn't no, 30 it years ago, which is the point of what we've been, it was very well, hard to I've get just been saying. Anyone no, remember? I mean, you could, you must, your mother must have known what it was like not to be able to go to a university. Remember the fights that were fought over that? My friend, I didn't go to university. I went to training college. Mm -hmm. And I trained to be a teacher. So but I mean, I, I'm sort of lost for words over I mean, this. I mean, a few years ago, a few years ago, a woman couldn't even have a, a mortgage. I mean, she had, I mean, they were, I mean, the women were at a grave disadvantage. You weren't, men, I mean, w weren't taking women seriously, even in debate, whereas today, women are taken much more seriously than before. The fact that you are here talking and we're listening, I mean, 20 years ago, we wouldn't have li listened with the same with the same view as we are today, or with the same seriousness to you are, as we are yeah, listening but today. But, but that applies not only to women. I mean, you know, in <laughs> in some societies, if you're black, you're not taken seriously. In some societies, well, if, yeah, you're but that, property, uh, if you're not a property, if you're yes. not a property owner, yeah. okay. So I mean, it's quite clear that there's there's injustices in societies, and they take all kinds of forms, and in perhaps different sorts of societies, different groups of people are, vic are victims, and indeed the groups of people who are victims of this often overlap, racism, sexism, and Yes, so but we on. must admit that women were victims. Sure, that's, I, I, well, I don't think... Well, to that degree, then, you would presumably agree that the feminist movement, whatever that means, because it's a pretty blanket term, has achieved commendable results. Yes, but, um, but I think, what's I mean, wrong with it, one, in your why opinion? Why does one have to get bogged down? I, I suppose, in a way, I agree with you. It's so obvious that so much has been achieved. That surely is not in dispute. Um, well, I think I it depends on what level you mean it's uh, it being achieved. I mean, if you look at the kind of society we've got today, if you look at the state of marriage, at the number of children in care, at the broken homes, all the way around us, instead of, you know, you seem in a way to be holding up the last 20 years as though we've moved into some kind of paradise. But the last 20 or 30 years are amongst the saddest, most full of pain in human well, personal life. I honestly don't life. think anybody has been saying that. You've taken sort of generalizations that various people have made feeling their way towards a conversation and erected a whole kind of philosophy of life attributed to the people who've uttered them. I don't think anybody's saying the last 20 years have been miraculous in, in furthering the, 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 the content well, of I'm human happiness. Well, I'm just sort of trying to bring things but down But things to have Earth. changed. Things are changing all the time. And that's why we're sitting here talking about it, presumably. Mm. Otherwise, why are we here if things are exactly the same as they've always They're been? They're changing and all the time. Be. They yeah, have always I I changed. I, yeah, but I suppose in a way, um, perhaps what Mary wants to say, if you like, I, obviously I think one of the, the um, points about feminism is it's identified the existence of a problem, okay? Yes, sir. Um, whether it's rights more, I mean, it doesn't, you know, whether it's in the legal sphere or indeed in the domestic sphere. But would sphere. 30 years ago, would you have, but, but, would Mrs. Thatcher would have been Prime Minister today, 30 okay, years ago? But, but would the you point have is, given the do chance? you regard the existence of Mrs. Thatcher as a solution? No, <laughs> but it is a step forward. Um, so what, you know, what is that? Certainly it's a step forward because now there is a precedent a, for it. It's a step forward, but certainly. Isn't, but isn't that an abstraction? I, I, I think that's the point. What's the step forward about the, you know, to just assert Mrs. Thatcher is 
Prime Minister, that's a step forward. Because it, it proved that it can be done. It <laughs> proved that women <laughs> have progressed. It proved that it can be done. India years before oh, yes, Thatcher. absolutely, years ago, yes, but, but you didn't right. have them in this country, so there's a difference. But John, how surely it's... John, how do you remember things in your young time? Uh, uh, in what way? In, the, in the how women were treated, how, how they lived. Uh, what, when I was uh, 17? Yeah, 17, mean, 18, yeah. that sort of thing. Well, it's very difficult to, well, we had to a compare time, because there was a war going on yes. and women had this fantastic opportunity to break free from their home lives and go out and do work and meet men. Well, exactly. <laughs> which they did. Which exactly. they did. Exactly. Exactly. Which they also did in the 60s, presumably, when the pill became available and they were freed well, in a different Well, the 60s sense. was the next great sexual yeah. explosion for women, wasn't it? But a good time was had by all. But the Fair fact is that you say break free means that they were, they were imprisoned almost. We I mean, I mean use I'm that not talking about myself. Break free. I was brought up by a very strict uh, yeah, Catholic well, family. But, but most women were brought up. Most free. women, I think, felt this amazing yeah. liberation. Absolutely. So you but that's the that liberation of the 40s, isn't what? it? Yes. Yes. The years of the war. Yeah, during yes. the war, yes. yes. And not only could you go out and get jobs and, and, and be on equal terms with men, and you could also feel that if you did have an affair, you were sort of with a, a, a man in the forces that um, you didn't feel guilty about it because, you know, you were doing your bit for England, <laughs> sort of thing. <laughs> Whereas before, it was very guilt-ridden and awful, and um, it was a whole different feeling. Did it then change it when the war was over in the 50s? Oh, after that, because I think you, w you went back to being a bit guilt-ridden after that. But I, I, I've unfortunately not had the opportunity to look at Shear's book but I mean, <laughs> there's supposed to have been this amazing revolution and all sorts of things that happened, and yet apparently there's a tome on the table saying that <laughs> four and a half thousand women are, ever, don't know about this amazing thing that's happened. You got it? Well, is that the <laughs> message? <laughs> well, not, not quite, but it's sort of like this, maybe, um, that a lot of women are, are it caught in the midst of a change. Um, Maybe you could say that democracy never came to the family, and now women have been struggling to make it arrive there, not only in terms of who does the housework. And I noticed that the word men should help with the housework was used a lot of times, which would imply women are still basically responsible for it and men will sort of help. But if both people are working outside the home, I guess it would be more equitable if both have the responsibility for the housework. But this book is about the emotional relationship a lot of women say that they're doing most of the emotional support. And most men in a previous study I did said that their best friends were women or their wives. But women don't say generally that their best friends are their husbands. They may love them, but if they want to talk to somebody, they'll call up a woman friend. And uh, so that implies that women are doing a little more nurturing and listening. Uh, if you want to talk to somebody, you might be more likely to be heard by another woman. Or maybe men feel uncomfortable talking about personal topics because they've been brought up to think that that's sissy or womanly or shouldn't watch soap opera stuff. They don't mind talking so about their own personal topics. I mean, they, they yes. <laughs> they'll talk endlessly to you about their problems, surely. Yes, and, and women... They won't yeah. sort of give you the right questions to get to your, your personal problems back. That's right. They're all, women were also saying that, that men don't listen to them and men don't draw them out. That's, That's very, true. Very if you go true. out to dinner with a man who you don't know very well, he'll talk right throughout at dinner about himself and he'll never ask you a single <laughs> personal question. Right. That sounds as though you've had an awful lot of unhappy dinner parties. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm putting my daughter on this um, um, more than me. She's had yeah. these experiences lately yeah. and she's telling me about them. Yeah. Of course, you're in men then. Sorry? <laughs> she should have more women to her dinner parties <laughs> than Yeah, I think she's starting to do that. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I gather in your book that you did have a, the conclusions that you've just been voicing. You really had a very small, was it only four and a half percent reply from all the questionnaires you sent out? So maybe. Good. Here's my chance to talk about methodology. <laughs> well, I was just going to Can say I? maybe, you know. That very small <laughs> percentage were the well, I sort of people that wanted to talk about these particular right. issues. Not well, yes, I mean, this, this, this is something that's been written about a lot in the papers. So I'd like to take the chance to say, I mean, after all, first of all, Freud did a lot of generalizing about women on the basis of three upper-class Viennese women, and nobody's been criticizing him 
very much for doing that, except I for the feminist I, movement. Yeah, not only from the <laughs> feminist movement, but... Well, <laughs> some psychologists have. Have you been criticized? Well, philosophically, you? people look, I mean, you yeah. know, the thing is, um, th th that's a whole new, that's a whole area, isn't it? Um, well, yes, but anyway, the, <coughs> the idea of how do you devise uh, theories of what's going on with people in society is, is uh, certainly a hotly debated topic in academia. But anyway, I'll just explain my sample once and for all. I'm sorry. It's very boring, but <laughs> just anyway, there's no way to get around it. Um, so there are two ways to do survey research, although I have never called this a survey, nor do I, nor am I very interested in surveys. But anyway, there are two ways to distribute a survey, and one is um, you choose a sample of people. This is how most polling is done in election uh, surveys. You choose a sample of people, and then you have to get most of them to respond, because if you don't, you've left out a large number of the population or a large group that would have been represented. Um, however, those people are never anonymous. So if you want them to be anonymous, you have to distribute things in another way, which is what I do. I send out large batches to places where women might be, or clubs, etc. And then as you get them back, you monitor who's sending them back. And you try over a period of time, in, in the, my case, seven years, to uh, carefully send out selected things to other states where you didn't get enough replies or to nursing homes for older women or something like that so that you finally wind up with a sample that does very clearly reflect the population in terms of age, occupation, etc. So it's not the number of replies. You get 4,500 is a huge sample. The Nielsen ratings for television in America are done on 1,200. Election polls are much smaller. It's not the well, number. It's, it's, it's the quality yeah. of the reply. Yeah. But yeah. in any case, now that I've said all that, I don't think the numbers matter. Uh, to me, it's a debate between women. There are many different points of view. Women in there argue with each other. I come in and argue at different times with what they may have said. You can disagree with anything I say, but you may like some of the things that they say. Well, I've interviewed uh, 289 for the English edition, 289 women, successful women, but from all walks of life. And for the French edition, I've interviewed 309 women. And. I couldn't come to any conclusion whatsoever because each woman is an individual. She has ideas of her own. Women don't agree on any topic, particularly <laughs> on men. Well the, only conclusion, the only conclusion, the only <coughs> conclusion where I found a common denominator, if you like, when I asked a woman at the end of the interview, even those women who claimed that there were more disadvantages even today of being a woman than, they were, you know, than there are advantages. When I asked them at the end of the day, given the chance, would you change places with men? Only oh, one, one single yes. lady, one single lady said yes, That's but right. all the rest said no. Exactly. Even right. those who were suffering, absolutely yes. suffering, and That's thought right. they were, you know, they were being almost persecuted. They wouldn't, they wouldn't change. And the, one of the reasons they said to me, first of all, the experience of childhood was an amazing experience. They wouldn't change it for the world. Men can't have children. They don't know what it is like. The other, other women said to me, we don't want to go to war. I don't want to go down to the pits. I don't want to carry things. I love what I'm doing. I don't want to yeah, be in Right. Mm. So right. why do you think the feminist movement then is such a dis has such a vociferous voice? Why, why the feminist movement have well, such a vociferous voice given? Yes, because... It's well, it's it's six, is it, no. voice? Well, well, I would say it does, yes, quite definitely. Yeah, I, no, I, I, I can't say one walks down the street and has people grabbing you by the collar and hammering feminist viewpoints on you. It may be prevalent in the media simply That's because it. a lot of women work in the media who are That's articulate right. and express That's those right. current opinions. That's I don't think... Point, uh, yeah, but if you like... Um, you, you, of course, refer to the media. I would be referring to more academic feminist thought, um, where um, the, it, it, the, 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 the argument, if you like, is very cogent, is very systematic, um, and in fact is quite contrary to the kinds of things. Is it Mayim? Nine. Nine. Yeah. Um, has, has been saying. So therefore, if you like, there, there's, there seems saying to be... Saying what? That, that, they, that they would 
in what way contradicts to what we've been saying? Well, in, in the sense that somehow, in spite of everything, there seems to be, a if you like, a certain fulfillment in their lives. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yes, yes. yes. the people. Yes, of course. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, in a way, that's, w that's what I'm trying to get clear about our discussion this evening. Um, there's this sample here of women who um, talk about loneliness. Well, they talk about more of it, yeah. Yeah, but there's some men who are lonely equally. Sure. Oh. But anyway, go, go on. Go absolutely. On. I, I mean, I'm trying, you know, in, in fact, we're saying things that actually don't knit together very well. All, all kinds of things have been said which are actually quite <coughs> contradictory. But that's because we're all different <coughs> people. No. That's what life's all about. No, we no all but have it isn't. Different it, no, because it, we're, very, we're, we're actually referring to arguments. We're referring to studies. We're referring well, we're referring to, to studies, oh, but most, I haven't read any of the books on the table. Wash the city out of your hair every day with new Nivea shampoo and Nivea conditioner. You could get cheaper motor insurance by dealing direct with the insurance service. If it comes to the crunch, you'll be glad you did. The insurance service, 0272 232 232. Telling you. Harlan J. Edison, but he's not in the Big Apple now. Yoji Yamato, but he's not in Japan. The family von Schneider, but this isn't a walk in the Black Forest. And the Collins family from London, but this isn't London. The fact is, people from all over the world are now living and working in Telford a British city in beautiful British countryside where lots of British people are running successful businesses. Just like the Americans, Germans, Japanese, Swiss, Telford. The success story continues. Here comes the lilt man. Lilt. Here comes the lilt man. Lilt. Lilt. With a totally tropical taste. Tropical taste with the totally tropical taste. Lilt. Hello. Oh, hello, Vaughan. Hey, you look busy. Oh, I'm just repotting these. So, do you want me to explain something? Oh, yes, it's, uh, it's this pension you showed me. Oh, yeah? Well, I'm, I'm still in two minds about it. Why? What's worrying you? Well, I know it doesn't cost very much a month, but, but well, what if I don't live to see it? Well, if the worst does happen, at least you'll leave your wife and kids with something. I don't see. Well, I better not tell Jan. Well, why not? She might put something in tea. We tailor personal pensions to your needs, not ours. When it comes to your pension, be prudent. See Prudential. Outside seems to me to be sort of making, bringing men and women together uh, doing away with their differences mm. and producing one sex, and which so seems so. to me terribly. I don't, I don't think it is. I think it's. Well, that's how it seems to me. What watching. In relation to, to and, and it's what's a good just deal. Been said is that there are many women who are still 
not happy about the way they are positioned in society and about the way men relate to them. And yeah, I think that's a very valid point. Well, I'm not saying it isn't, but it seems to. to me this sort of intense passion that I should be understood, that I should be able to get out of life what I want, irrespective of whoever may be around me, men or women or whatever, that in a way diminishes women. But I don't if think we're that's going to, what I just let me finish what, what I'm saying. If we're going to be so looking into ourselves, making demands for ourselves as women, or even as individuals, I think in the very going into ourselves, we deny ourselves the richness that comes by losing yourself in giving to other people and thinking for other people and not being concentrating, oh, what am I? Am I more male than female? Am I a feminist? It doesn't matter. If you really give yourself to the people who are around you, mm. then you find, without looking for it, you find an identity. <coughs> but as soon as you start looking for your identity, you kind of diminish yourself and everybody else. But That's how it seems to me. Never stopped mm. people. What? Feminism has never stopped people giving to people around them. I mean, I'm quite interested in what, what you find so threatening about feminism and about women who want to change their own lives. I can't see that it threatens no, you, or I does it? No, I don't find I mean, it threatening to me, not in any shape or form. I just think it's really rather sad. That sounds a bit patronising, if you don't mean it to be Julie, sad. Julie, you've changed your life very much. Why was that? What, what led you to make this decisive and dramatic change in your life? Which one was that? Well, you were, you were, <laughs> you were married, but then you, you now have a, a, a woman partner. Uh -huh. So you, you, you made a decision, did you not? Um, I, I think for me it was a process rather than, than a decision. I would find it very difficult to pinpoint. Um, if you're talking about why I, I now have a relationship with a woman as opposed to a man, um, I'd find it difficult to pinpoint a decision that I made. It was a process, you know, which involved a lot of things. But don't you think ex extreme feminists don't accept the fact that w men and women are complementary? Complementary meaning what? Meaning that, uh, th that uh, the complementary in the sense that uh, we need each other, we complement each That's other. Right. That's, That's right. That's what I mean. Yes. That Once you reach for instance, well. I'll, I'll let me, let me put it to you in a different way. I interviewed a lady in France who was supposed to be one of the best economic brains in France. I mean, she's the head of uh, Banque Occidentale, she's on all uh, companies, and I said to her, I was talking to her, and I said to her, is there a difference between men and women? Because, you know, is it only conditioning, or there are certain things that men can do better, certain things that women can do better? She said to me, if I have a very important financial project, I get the best man in my team and the best woman in my team, and I ask each one to make me a report. And I said, invariably, when I get the male and the female report, I get the whole oh picture, lot. the whole yes. picture, because there are certain things That's that right. a woman's intuition or women are very good at details, yes. men are not very good yes. at details. So she, she said, all I can say is we men and women are complementary. Right. Well, I didn't oh. say, I actually, sorry. Uh, it's just that you took that out of what I said. I didn't actually say anything about what I felt about men. Oh, no, 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 I didn't say that. <laughs> no. I said extreme, no, but I said extreme feminism. I asked you that? the question, what I did. I